Hi everyone and welcome to another episode. Today we're going to be talking about getting the most out of your 3018 Pro by tuning some of the GRBL settings. So stick around and let's get started. So for anyone who saw my recent video on tips and tricks for the 3018 Pro, you'll know that at the end of it I started to talk about a tutorial by Graham Bland about calibrating your GRBL settings. And he's been kind enough to let me share that with everyone on this channel. So we're going to cover part of that tutorial today. But there is a link in the description to download the full tutorial from Graham because he goes into lots of detail and it's really useful, especially if you're a beginner. So I would advise downloading it and giving it a read. Now before we actually get started on changing anything and looking at settings, I do need to mention a few things. First, Graham did all his calibration tests with the laser for the 3018 Pro. And the reason for this is the settings we're looking at today have a bigger impact on using the laser than the spindle. However, because most of you out there use it with the spindle, we're going to try and modify some of those tests to see how we can improve the performance of using the spindle rather than the laser. Now, the settings that we're actually looking to do, at today affect the acceleration of each axis and the maximum travel speed of each axis. And that's where we're going to gain time and improve the performance of the machine. So what this uh, means in reality is that when your uh, cutting head is moving from one position to another in order to make those different cuts, that's where we're going to gain the advantage. Now, what we can't do with these settings is physically make the machine cut quicker. If you're looking to achieve that, then you need to upgrade the spindle as we've covered in previous uh, episodes. So I'm just being realistic and upfront in what to expect from this calibration setup. And the last thing I need to mention is there is literally a storm going on outside. So if you hear any wind and bangs and clongs, yeah, the weather's terrible out there. So, you know, I'm trying to keep the audio as clean as I can. But let's get reset up with the computer and start to take a look at some of those settings. So the first thing you want to do is open up UGS and this is where we'll be doing all of the work today. The next thing you want to check is that your console panel is open. If you can't see the console panel, go up to window and select console. And this is just the panel that allows us to see the different settings that are going on within our GRBL control. Now, what we want to do is take a backup of our original settings just as a reference point to begin with. So in the command line, type dollar dollar and hit enter. Now this displays all the different GRBL settings that are stored on your control board. If you scroll up to the top to where you see the dollar zero and then drag and highlight that all the way down to the bottom, press control C to take a copy and then open up something like notepad and paste all the settings in there. And simply go file, save as, and save it somewhere convenient like your desktop. Now, while we've got this screen open, I will just show you the different settings that we're going to be looking at today. The $110 settings down to the $112 settings, these are your maximum speed that the spindles can travel. So if you imagine this as a car, this is the top speed it can achieve. The next set of settings is the $120 down to the $122. And this is how fast it can accelerate up to that speed. So for example, this is 1600 and what this down here is telling it to do is how fast it can accelerate up to that 1600 speed. Now these settings themselves each relate to an individual axis which is labelled up next to them. It typically goes X, Y and Z. So 110 is X, 111 is Y, 112 is Z. And then it starts again for these 120 settings to 122. What we'll also finish up looking at is the $1.30 settings, which is your maximum spindle speed. Now, I'll talk about this a bit more later on, but the reason this is relevant is the closer it is to your actual spindle speed, the more control you can have over it and just get a little bit more out of it. All right, now if we go back to UGS. So before changing any settings, what we want to do is just create ourselves a bit of a reference point so we can see how much the settings have improved at the end of this calibration test. Now all I'm going to do is simply run a very quick piece of G-code. And as you'll see, it's just JD Designs, and this is only a light pass, but what it'll do is give us a rough time code of how long this takes, 
And then once we've done the calibration at the end, we will run this exact same test and we'll see an improvement and we can work that out as a percentage. Now, you don't need to physically run this with a bit in, you can just simply run the G code without any bit in and just get the time that it takes for your machine to do it. So I'm just going to simply reset the zero on this point and send it off running and then we'll get a time frame for how long that took. So that program quickly ran and as we can see it took 5 minutes and 41 seconds. Now this program only has 11 cuts which is one for each letter other than the D's which both have two. The more cut paths your design has, the more time these settings will actually save you. So basically the more complex of a program you're running, the more time you'll save. And as I say, the purpose of running this test is purely just to get a bit of a timestamp so we can track the progress later. So the first thing we're going to start to look at is the acceleration settings. Now if we go back to our settings that we saved earlier, we can see that the acceleration settings for the x-axis, which is $120, is at 20 millimeters per second. So if we go back into UGS now, we can start to look at the acceleration test. What we're going to do is just open up a very simple piece of G-code. And all this does is send the carriage right 50 mil and then it sends it back left 50 mil and it does that twice Now the reason we're doing this is because with the acceleration of the carriage itself it's got to get up to that top speed as fast as possible but then slow it down at the end as well and send it back the other way if you're just doing it in one direction you can get your speeds up much higher but the problem is when it tries to traverse it and send it back the other way you'll often find that it stalls and that could cause a you know ruin a job for you so we need to make sure it can traverse at the same acceleration speed in both directions. So to do that, we're just going to roughly move the carriage into the middle of the board. And then reset our zero point for there. So as I say, we know that the acceleration command for the x-axis is $120 and the one that we had in place at the moment is 20 as well. So to increase that we type $120 equals and then our new increment. I'm going to start off by taking this up to 50 and then I'll increase it each time at 50 just to see how we get on. And you'll know as soon as the acceleration starts to fail because you'll hear it jump or it won't quite sound right. So we'll put this up to 50 to begin with, hit enter, and that's put the new command in. If you'd want to double check, again, just type dollar dollar, hit enter, and you can now see the dollar 120 is at 50. So what we're going to do is just quickly run this command to send it back and forth twice at 50 mil. As you can see that sounded fine so we can then take that up another 50 we'll run it again and again it sounds good now you can start to be more aggressive with these increments and maybe take it up to 100 each time but just do be careful because you don't want to push it too much. So what we'll do now is go $120 equals 200 and we'll run that again. Now as you can probably hear, the wind up to get it to the maximum speed is getting less and less each time. And therefore it just gets up to the top speed much quicker. But you need to be careful that you don't push it too fast because as I say, that's when you start to miss steps or it will jam. So let's take this up again. We'll go dollar $120 equals $300. And we'll run it again. So you get the gist of what we're doing at this stage. We're just going to keep taking that increment up 
until it gets to a stage where it starts to struggle. So I'll speed this up a bit now and just keep going and then I'll kick the video back in once we're at a phase where you can start to hear that the motor is struggling a little bit. So I jumped ahead at this point and I went from I went from dollar one twenty equals eighteen hundred to dollar one twenty equals two thousand five hundred. And as you will have seen, then it started to stall. I'll run that again, and you'll see it. So that basically means we've taken the settings too high now. What I'm going to start to do is bring them down a little bit until we get to a point where we're comfortable again. So that was 2,500, I'm going to bring it down to 2,300. And run it again. So it's still jamming, we'll bring that down further. Jammed again, hopefully we're getting close to it now. So there we are, we've got our dollar 120 from the default setting at 20 up to 2000. So that's quite an increase. Now, when you run this for every axis, you will get a different number and every machine will be slightly different. So if you don't make it to 2000, don't think there's a problem with your machine. It's just that they are all a little bit different. Ultimately, you could go beyond 2000 and get a better reading. But what you need to do at this stage is make a note of that number. So we've got $120 equals 2000. Now for safety, what I always say is try and run those figures at about 80%. So dollar 120 at 2000 would then become dollar 120 equals 1600 now i know i should be able to run that all the time and it should be pretty comfortable at those speeds just to be safe we'll run it one last time at the new figure And that's the calibration of the acceleration done for the x-axis. Now we'll move on to the y-axis. So again, if we go back to our original settings, we know the y-axis 1, 2, 1 is at 20 again. So we'll come back to UGS and we'll start off doing a similar process. We'll load in the same test, but for the y-axis. And that just sends it back and forth at 50 mil doing exactly the same thing. So we'll take the setting up to begin with and go dollar one to one equals 50. And we'll run that. And then we'll bump that up to 100. Do the same again. And we'll keep taking that up in 100 increments until it starts to jam like it did with the X axis. So I'll speed this up a little bit for you. So we've just got that up to 2400 and it's starting to jam. So we're going to bring that back down again. So we'll go dollar one to one equals, let's say 2200. And we'll run it. Now that's definitely still jamming. So 
the machine just got jammed on the end there because typically what you will find is it may stroll towards the edges of the rails rather than it being in the center. So we're just going to bring that down again. And run it once more. So again, I'm quite comfortable with that. And that was at 2000. So if we use the 80% rule again, that means we make our dollar one to one at 1600. Just run it to be safe again. So at this point, we could also do the same calibration for the Z-axis. But I'm going to leave the Z-axis to the end, and there's a reason for this. Out of the three different axes, the Z-axis is the one that needs to be the most sensitive, because that can cause the most damage. It can either jam the bit into the wood, or it can break the carriage itself. So we need to be a bit more sensitive when dealing with that. So we'll calibrate the top speed now of the X and Y axis, and then we'll come back to the Z axis at the end and do both the calibration tests for that at the same time. So if we come back over to our settings, we can see that the top rate for the X axis is currently set at 1600. So that's $1.110 at 1600. So what we're going to do to begin with is take that up to quite a high number that we know we may never achieve. So we'll go dollar 110 equals 3000. Now what that's just done is set the top speed for the x-axis at 3000 in any direction whether it's going left or right and what we will do up here is adjust the feed rate slowly to go up in 100, 100 mil increments until we get to a speed that we're happy with. So we'll take that up to 1700 to start with and we'll just send it to the right by 50 mil and just bring it back. Again, that seems fairly smooth, so we'll take it up to 1800. Run the same. And again, you can see where we're going with this. We'll just keep doing that in 100 increments until we get to a speed where it starts to struggle. So we've got the speed up to 2,900. I don't know if you can hear it on the camera, but it just starts to sound a little bit rough when it's traversing each way. So I'm going to stop at that point and not take the speed up anymore. Now again, using the 80% rule that we did before, I'm going to bring this down to a number that I'm comfortable with using it on a regular basis. So 80% of 2,900 is just over 2,300, but we'll round it to 2,300 just for ease. So we go dollar one one zero equals 2,300, and we'll run that. It's worth pointing out at this phase that even though the feed rate here says 2,900, because I set the dollar 110 to 2,300, it won't go any higher than 2,300 no matter what figure I put in this box over here. So if we now do the same for the y-axis, again we can go back and check what the y-axis was. So we can see dollar one eleven equals 1,600, and we'll take that up to a big number to begin with as well, like 3,000. So dollar one 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 equals three thousand. And we'll start from the same point here. So seventeen hundred, which is a one hundred increment on the original, and we'll just send it back and forth as we previously did. And again keep going up in one hundred increments. So I've just got this up to 2,800 and as I run it, again, I'm just starting to hear that little sound that makes it feel a little bit rough. So I'm going to, so I'm going to leave it at 2,800 and again, applying that 80% rule, 
Although technically it's just under 2,300, I'm going to round it to 2,300 for the sake of keeping them both the same. So we go dollar one 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 equals 2,300. Now, as I say, you may have completely different settings and the different axes will have different speeds altogether. So now we've calibrated the acceleration rates and the top speed for both the X and Y axis. Let's start to take a look at the Z axis. Now, the reason I've left this till last, as I say, is because the Z axis needs to be a little bit slower and a little bit more controlled than the other axis. And it's also the one that can cause the most damage if something goes wrong. And one of the reasons we left it till last is because you'll see on your original settings that typically your maximum rate for the Z axis is much lower than the other two axes. And this is something that we need to take into consideration. Now to try and control the acceleration test, leaving it at 100 millimeters per minute is probably a little bit too low. So what we're gonna do is take that up straight away to something a little bit higher. So maybe 300 as a starting point. So we go $112, equals 300 and we'll then also adjust the z value in here and we'll make that something i don't know around 10 mil just to be safe now you want to make sure that your z axis is sitting somewhere in the middle of the carriage in order to do this because if it goes up too high or down too low obviously it's going to hit and jam so now we've just taken that up to 300 we'll just do a quick test And then we'll start to focus on the acceleration settings. So if we come back and we can check the acceleration settings for the z-axis, is at 20, so that's $112 equals 20. And we'll take that up to 50 to begin with. So $112, sorry, $122 equals 50. And we'll just run this up and down. That seemed pretty good, we'll keep going. So at this point I've got the acceleration up to 2400. Now I'm happy with that speed, I don't want to take it any further. Obviously you can if you want and continue to increase it until it stalls. But you also have to remember because you're running this at a slightly slower speed going up and down, it will affect the acceleration value and you can probably also increase it much more. But also because it's a shorter spindle, the amount of room it has to gain that acceleration is less as well. So again, always keep the values a little bit lower. So now we can actually start to look at the top speed of the z-axis, which is, go back to our original, is our $112 setting. At the moment, as I say, the default setting was 100, and we took it up earlier to, I think it was 400. Sorry, and we took it up earlier to 300. So now we're going to start to increase that again and see what we can get that up to. So we go $112 equals 400 move it up and we'll keep doing the same again So I've got the dollar one one two up to a thousand millimeters now as you can see this accelerates quite quick. Now the reason I'm not going to take that any further is because you don't want it jamming into the wood at that speed. So I'm going to leave it at 1000 for now and see how we get on with that. So at this point we're going to look at our spindle speed setting which is our $1.30 setting. So we can see the default that it came in at was 1000. Now as I touched on earlier, you changing this value won't physically make your spindle cut at any faster rate but what we can start to do is by getting it closer to the actual rpm is be able to have more control over it so to my knowledge the standard stock spindles that come with these machines run at around 9000 rpm at 24 volts now the way this works is if you're trying to slow that down so for example if you only want the spindle to run at half the speed which is 4000 rpm then the control board only sends half the power, so it would send 12 volts. 
Now, so the reason this is relevant to get your RPM speed as close to the spindle is because it gives you more control over it in varying the amount of power that goes to it. So if you've seen my previous videos, you will know that the spindle I've got in at the moment is a 20,000 spindle. So what I'm going to do is set my dollar thirty to twenty thousand. So we go dollar thirty equals twenty thousand. Now the reason I've done that is when I'm actually designing programs in the different software, and if I want to control the spindle speed, I can put exact figures in to control it. So again. If I'm cutting something that requires a slower speed, I can put in a relevant figure, maybe 10,000, and the board knows then to send only half of the power. So now we've calibrated most of our settings, what I'm going to do again is run the same design that we did at the start and see what the time difference is. So we go open, load that same file in, and I'm just going to roughly jog the head back to its start position. So it doesn't need to be exact, but we'll reset the zero, run that same program again, and let's see how long it takes now. So there we have it. The job's complete. And what's there in a time of 3 minutes and 39? I think the original file was 5 minutes and 48. So I don't know, rough math on that, a 40% saving on time. I'm pretty impressed with that. I don't think it will be that amount of saving on every job, but it's a good place to start. And it shows that the settings that we have changed have really made a difference in this particular job. Now in a fairy tale world, that would be everything. You've just not 40% off the cutting time. They've got some really fast settings to be able to crack in on with. But if you start to move your different axis to the four parameters, you might find that you start to get jams and sticking points. And that's what we need to look at next. So for me, I happen to know that the far left or far right of the X axis or the far front and far back of the Y axis is where it's most likely to jam. Now, this isn't always because of the top speed, it's usually because of the acceleration. So the machine physically can't get it up to speed quick enough because of that extra tension. So we need to then look at the acceleration settings and say, well, have we pumped them up a bit too much? Do we need to bring them down? Now, you might have a perfect machine and that doesn't happen, but given that some of these machines are produced very cheaply, there's a good chance you may get those sticking points. So that's what we're gonna cover now. So just to show you an example of what may happen, I'm going to send the z-axis from one side to the other, and as I prepare to send it back the other way, you should hear it jam. Actually, that's a perfect example because it's jamming from the start. Not planned, but let's run with it. So what we know now is that the top speed or the acceleration is a bit too high because there's a particular tight spot around that area. So we need to bring them down together. We know that the top speed on the x-axis is 2300 and we know that the acceleration speed is 1600. So what we're going to do is bring these down together until we find the speed that we're comfortable with. So we go $110 equals and let's bring that down to about 1800. It's a bit of a big jump but it's better to be safe. And then $120 equals and let's bring that down to 1000. Right, let's try sending it across again. So as we can see, it's now moving and it didn't jam at the start. The question is, will it jam on the way back? So there we have it. We've brought the settings down to a safer parameter for them to work. Now you can spend time keep adjusting these and going up and down with finer measurements to get the perfect settings that you're after. But as I say, do remember that once you get the most out of your settings, just bring it down to that 80% rule because it's better to be safe than to have an entire job jam. And obviously do this on both the X axis and the Y axis. For me personally, I don't have an issue with the Z axis, but if you do on your machine, you can also do the same with that. So now I've gone through all the tight spots on my machines and reduced the settings accordingly. You can see they've come down quite a bit. So what was 2,300 for the maximum rate has now come down to 1,800. 
and what was I think 1600 on the acceleration has now come down to around a thousand for the X and the Y axis. So it's a bit slower than what we had earlier but it's better to be safe and know that this job will cut all the way through rather than it jamming. Now just as a final test we're going to run the JD Designs program once more and see what the time difference is and that will give us a better indication overall of what we've saved. So even after we slowed these, those speeds down, it's barely made a difference to the outcome. And we've still saved about 40% off the original time, which is great news. So after doing all those tests and making those tweaks to the settings, you should now have a machine that's running faster, smoother, and you can turn those jobs out a little bit quicker. Hopefully you don't hit the snags that I hit with the sticky spots on the axis, but at least if you do, you know how to get around them. Because as you saw with my settings, I had to bring them down quite a bit from the height that we got them to in order to keep the machine running safely and smoothly. Now, don't forget when you're doing this type of setup or you are running your machine in general, always use lubricant because it minimizes the amount of tight spots on those axes and just keeps everything running better. I wanna give a final thank you to Graham for allowing us to use and share this tutorial. Obviously, this is a slightly different version to his, but do download it and read it because there's lots of useful information in there that we haven't covered in this video. As always, if you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. It makes a big difference. If you're about to give it a thumbs down, at least let me know why in the comments section below. That is everything for today and I'll see you all on the next video.